So, hello everybody. Uh, I don't think I need to really introduce you to Kirk, but there it is. Uh, maybe introduce you to Marshall Kirk McCusick, by definition the BSD hacker. He's going to talk to you about the design and implementation of ZFS. Thank you. So, we were working on this little book thing that you probably know about. And uh, I had originally thought that ZFS was just going to be sort of a section in the chapter that talks about file systems. Uh, and then at some point, one of my reviewers looked at it and said, you only have six pages on ZFS. That's not enough. And I thought about it for a little bit. And I thought, yeah, you're, you're right about that. I guess I have to do a whole chapter on it. And so we reorganized the way the whole book was done. Uh, and there I was, staring at a chapter. Then, all of the text that I had in it was the title. So how do you go about actually figuring this out? Well, there's got to be all kinds of documentation about it. I mean, there's tons of stuff out there about ZFS. But it's all about how to use ZFS and not about how it's actually put together. And so uh, I found a paper that had been written for the LISA conference, but it hadn't been accepted. And so there were some sort of copies of it floating around. There's some slide decks that uh, had been used to talk to customers about it. Uh, and then I finally found the resource that I really needed, which was Matt Ahrens, who would actually answer my emails and actually, uh, if I bought him lunch, would sit down and we could actually, I could show him prototypes of things. And then, of course, there's the quarter million lines of code that you can read if you really want to figure out how things work. So I would try and read the code, and I'd come to this lunch, and Matt would say, huh, yeah, that's an interesting way of thinking of it, but no, that's not the way it works. Uh, so really, that chapter came about because Matt basically led me through uh, and, and made it happen. And so uh, a great debt to him for doing that. At any rate, uh, this, according to Matt, is the only complete documentation on how ZFS works, and considering it's only a 30-page chapter, uh, is obviously just a, a brief introduction. Um, so anyway, I then uh, had to put together some slides for my tutorial. Uh, and in doing that, I said, well, I can just take some of those for this talk. Uh, and I did that, and then I did a dry run of the talk, and it went on for an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so last night I whacked out four more slides, and I'll try and go through it a little more quickly uh, than my dry run. So let me just give you the, the overview of ZFS. Uh, the basic idea is that it's this sort of new generation of file system technology, which is the never overwriting, the, the, the copy on write, if you will, file system. So once something gets written, you, you don't go back and change it. If you have a traditional file system like the FAST file system, you, you, you know, seek to a point in a file and you write, we just read the old thing in, change the bytes you want to change, and write it right back to where it came from. Uh, so that's, you, you update. Whereas in ZFS, as you'll see, if you, if you modify an existing file, that block, that modified block, will be placed somewhere else, and then the inode will be changed to go point to that new copy of the block. All right, because it's a non-overwriting file system, you don't have the problems that you do with the traditional file systems where it can become inconsistent. You've updated some things, but not other things, and uh, so the file system has to be either rolled back using a log or a journal or uh, FSCK or whatever your poison is that you happen to like. Uh, in the case of a non-overwriting file system, it is always consistent. It, 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 you have a consistent version of the file system, and now you're going to move from one consistent version to another. So what will happen is you'll write everything out that needs to be changed, and the last step is that you just uh, you actually create the checkpoint, the move forward, by just writing the, a new Uber block in this case. Think of it as sort of a glorified super block. And so Either that write has occurred or it hasn't. If it hasn't yet occurred, then you have the old consistent version. And if the write is completed, then you have the new consistent version. Uh, but you're never at a point where the file system is inconsistent. OK? So you just atomically step forward checkpoint by checkpoint. Uh, it has things like snapshots, uh, which are read-only, clones, which are read-write. So uh, if you want a clone, you have to take a snapshot. And then you make a clone of the snapshot, and you can then you know, modify away. And if, you know, one of the common uses for clones is that you'll make a clone and do an up, 
update or an upgrade of the system, and if it all works out, then you just say, all right, that's now the file system. If it doesn't work out, you say, yep, just throw it away, let me try again. Okay, uh, with a non-overwriting file system, it's really easy to do snapshots, it's really easy to do clones. Uh, you can have you know, piles of them. In ZFS, there are no limits other than the amount of disk space you have to throw at them. ZFS has a lot of metadata redundancy, data checksums. We'll see that when we talk about the way uh, the block pointers are implemented. We have selective data compression and deduplication. Uh, data compression and de deduplication uh, requires a lot of memory to hold the dedupe table. If you just make the whole file system, uh, you know, the whole file system uh, deduplicated, uh, you can often blow out your memory and it gets very slow. So uh, ZFS gives you the ability to selectively say what's being deduplicated, what's being compressed, and you can just do it uh, for the things where it makes sense. Uh, unlike a traditional file system where you give it a certain amount of space when you create the file system and that's it, uh, with ZFS you have a pool of blocks and that pool of blocks is shared among all the file systems and clones and so on uh, that are running in that pool. You have um, mirroring and also single, double, and triple uh, parity RAID. Uh, I don't have time. I pulled the RAID stuff because it just takes too long to explain, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it's in the book. <laughs> uh, space management, you can put quotas on, on users. Uh, and you can also reserve space. You can say, make sure that there is this amount of space available to this file system uh, so that uh, you don't have like one file system go crazy on you and then everybody else uh, dies a horrible death. And there's fast remote replication and backups, which I also won't talk about. All right, so let's start with the structural organization. Uh, there's sort of, let's come on now. You were working just a minute. There we go. Okay, just whack it. Okay, so we have these sort of two main layers here. We have what's called the meta object set layer and the object set layer. The meta object set layer, this is the thing that essentially is the pool. So in traditional file systems, all the block allocation and space map management is done down by the file system. Here the file systems don't mess with that stuff. When they need a block, they just come up to the pool here and say, uh, give me a block, and they use it, and when they're done with it, they just hand it back to the pool. And so, uh, at the top of all this is an Uber block, and that's the, the, the thing that's actually taking the checkpoints. So when we talk about moving from a consistent state to, from one to another, uh, we're in fact not getting just a, a consistent state for a particular file system, you get a consistent state for that every file system, every clone, every everything that's in the pool. So what will happen is, in essence, uh, when we get ready to take a checkpoint, we'll go to each file system, have them write out the stuff that they need to write out, uh, and when, they've all, when all the things in the pool have done that, then we uh, write out anything that then has to be updated in the pool, and then finally we update the Uber block at the top, and that's when the checkpoint actually happens. And again, I'm going to show you a little example uh, of how all that happens there. Okay, so. In these pictures, when you see something that's just an arrow, that is a single block pointer. And when you see something that's one of these triangles, uh, that is a, a set of, of blocks and indirect blocks and so on. So all of these things that have the triangles on them are, are, can grow sort of arbitrarily large. Uh, just think of it really sort of like an inode that allows files to get arbitrarily large. You just keep adding indirect block pointers and uh, until you have enough to map out whatever you want. So, and then an object set is, is the thing that sort of describes, uh, is used to describe whatever this object is that's being drawn. Okay, so at the meta object layer, we've got this, this file, if you will, or this set of things. Uh, the first thing in there is always the master, and that's where we store uh, various properties about whatever the object is. So you'll see pretty much always, we always have a, a master thing at the front uh, to store properties. And that's things like for a file system, where is it mounted, and uh, things about how the privileges are being managed, etc. cetera. Uh, then here you can see each of the things in this is some particular uh, 
underlying either snapshot or file system or clone uh, or a zvol. Uh, a zvol is, is, it looks sort of like a, a raw disk partition. Okay, and then finally at the very end, we have the space map. And the space map is keeping track, it, it's, think of it as a big bit map with one bit per block. So it's, it's where we're keeping track of what space is available. Okay, so in this particular example here, I've, I've taken a file system. So this again is just a pointer to another object set. And this, this thing, the object set that we use for a file system, uh, is essentially a set of inodes. So if you just think of it uh, logically, we've got all the inodes that make up the file system, uh, and they're just in an array. So you just index into this array. Uh, so here we have directory, file, symbolic link, et cetera. Uh, and for a file, of course, it's going to have a set of, of indirect block pointers to describe the data that's the contents of the file. Okay, so Uberblock anchors the pool. The meta object layer here is going to uh, have an array of all of the objects, all the file systems, clones, snapshots, and so on. Uh, then each of the, of the objects in here references the, uh, an object set which describes its set of whatever it is it holds. So in the case of a file system, all the inodes that reference all the bits and pieces that make up that file system. All right, so block pointers. In, when we went from FFS1 to FFS2, uh, this is where we realized that 32-bit uh, block pointers weren't big enough to deal with large disks. And so we, heaven forbid, went to 8-byte, 64-bit block pointers. We have nothing over block pointers in ZFS. The ZFS block pointers are the titanic of block pointers. 256 bytes of block pointer. This is for each block pointer in the file system. Okay, so what can we possibly do with all that stuff? Well, the first thing you get here is, this is where the redundancy can come in, because you see we have three different, potentially up to three different pointers to uh, something on a disk. So a, 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 a reference to the disk here, we first of all have a 64-bit a offset actually 63 bits because there's this thing called a gang block. If the disk gets too fragmented, we don't actually have it all in one place, then it's, it's made up of some smaller pieces. Uh, we have the device on which it resides. Uh, grid is just saved, not currently used. And uh, the, the, uh, si the size of the, the thing that we're pointing at uh, out on the, on the disk. Uh, this, this, you'll notice there's three sizes, A size, P size, and L size. A size is how much actual disk space is being used, including, for example, uh, any RAID parity blocks and you know, all, all the other stuff that we need. It's or, you know, how much actual physical disk are we using. And so if we're going to have redundancy, and we, uh, by default, any metadata in ZFS has at least two copies made. So it, an indirect block will always have at least two copies of that indirect block, and you can crank it up to three if you want. So the first copy is referenced by this first one, the second copy is referenced by the second one, and if there's a third copy, it will be referenced by the third one here. And ZFS carefully tries to uh, make sure that if you have multiple copies, and, and if you in fact have multiple disks that make up the pool, that they will be on different media, different disks. Uh, so that if uh, one particular disk goes down, uh, that you'll be able to pick it up off of one of the other disks. Okay, uh, level just tells us where we are in the, in if, uh, what level of indirect block, single, double, triple, whatever. The uh, checksum here tells us uh, what algorithm we're using for the checksum. You'll notice down here at the bottom we have the checksum of the, you know, the contents of the block. Note that the checksum is not stored with the rest of the block. It is stored here. And of course, we need just one, even if we have multiple copies, because they should all have the same checksum value. Uh, and in fact, if you have, for example, two levels uh, or 
three, three sets of redundancy, you can, uh, you, you, know, you pull in the first one and the checksum fails, uh, you can pull in these other two uh, and you know, verify that the checksum does in fact work. Uh, and then use that to decide that this one should be updated. Okay, so uh, by not storing the checksum where the data is stored, uh, essentially, uh, if the data somehow gets corrupted, you, the, because the checksum is stored elsewhere, uh, you, hopefully that, the, the checksum will not have gotten corrupted. All right, then you then have the physical size and uh, the logical size. Uh, these will normally be the same, but if you're doing compression, uh, the logical size is typically going to be bigger than the actual amount of space that you need uh, to store the data because the compression has made the physical size go down. Uh, com compression here just tells you what algorithm you used for the compression. Uh, we also have the, the birth times, and I'm not going to go into uh, all of the details, but uh, these times are not uh, wall clock time. Rather, they are which uh, of the checkpoints, uh, in which checkpoint did this thing get created? Uh, so it, we start off at checkpoint zero when we first create the pool, and then that checkpoint just keeps getting incremented uh, each time we do another checkpoint. Uh, we choose to use the checkpoint number rather than time because if you took two checkpoints within the same second, uh, you might end up uh, with these things matching, uh, and you don't want that to happen. Okay, so whenever I talk about a block pointer, I'm talking about one of these things. And uh, because they're very large, uh, you want to be, uh, you, you would like them to refer to something fairly big uh, because of the overhead that you're incurring by having them. So most blocks in ZFS are 128K. Uh, now, small files uh, can use smaller pieces. So uh, if you're running on, on disks with 4K sectors, a file may use just a single 4K sector. So in fact, this thing may just point to something that's 4K. But Typically, when a file, anytime a file has grown over 128 kilobytes in size, it will be made up of some number of 128 kilobyte blocks. Okay? So, management of blocks. As I've already said, the blocks are all kept in a pool, and we have multiple file systems, and all their snapshots and clones are also held in that pool. And then blocks from the pool are given to the file system as they're needed, and then they're reclaimed back to the pool when they get freed. Uh, now, it turns out that actually the freeing of blocks turns out to be one of the more difficult things to deal with in ZFS. Uh, not difficult in the sense of uh, it's, it's hard to get it right, but it's, it, it takes a lot of code uh, and a lot of rather interesting algorithms to be able to figure out when a block is really free because what will happen is you, you first allocate the, the file uh, and then you've taken some number of snapshots and all of the snapshots are also going to have inodes that refer to that block. And so just because it, you remove the file in the file system doesn't mean that we can actually free the block. We can't free the block until the it's both free in the file system, and we've gotten rid of all of the snapshots that reference it. So the sort of quick but not completely accurate way that I can describe this is with what are called dead lists. And so when you remove a file, uh, we go through, we take, find all the blocks that are in that file, and then we say, okay, are there any snapshots uh, of this file system? If so, they'll be on a, a list sorted from the one that was created most recently to the one that was created furthest in the past. And so we pass the blocks that we want to free down to the next snapshot. And if that snapshot is still referencing the block, it says, oh, well, I'll hold on to that. Uh, and if it's not, then it just trickles down until it's all the snapshots have had an opportunity to look at it. And if none of them want it, then it, and only then does it get handed back to the pool and actually made free. OK, so we would already talked. You can reserve space to make sure it'll be there, and you can impose quotas. All right, so that same picture that you saw before, uh, I've now drawn in a bit more detail. So again, we've got the Uber block at the top. 
uh, we have the object set, which you saw before. Embedded in that is a D node. And a D node, to a first order approximation, is what we would call in the traditional file system an inode. It's the data structure that keeps track of uh, certain properties about uh, the node and also and primarily keeps track of the, the block pointers. Now, unlike the traditional file system where we have direct blocks and single indirect and double indirect and so on, in ZFS, we, we start with a, well, we have a single pointer and the original, so you have one direct block pointer and then if the file gets bigger than 128K, so it needs two pointers, uh, instead of keeping the direct block pointer and then creating a, a single indirect block, we just promote uh, the, the direct block. We, we allocate an indirect block and then we make the, what was previously the direct block pointer is the first entry in the single indirect. And then we just start growing the single indirect. And if we fill it up, then we allocate a double indirect. We take that single indirect and make it the first entry of the double indirect and so on. So a file either has a single direct block pointer or it has a pointer to a single indirect uh, block or it has a pointer to a double indirect block or it has a pointer to a triple indirect block. It doesn't have, uh, as we do in the regular file, or in the traditional file system, uh, all, all three uh, mixed together. Okay, so we have some number, some number of levels of indirect block pointers here and then in fact what we end up with is this array of these D nodes and then uh, the D node has a, a, a sort of an area at the end of it that is uh, sort of free space that can be used for different purposes. So depending on what it is that the D node references, we put different things into that free space at the end of it. Uh, we use a thing called a data set uh, when we are referring to uh, most of the uh, things like file systems and snapshots. Okay, so the, we have the, uh, the original master node here, and since it can have sort of an arbitrary amount of stuff in it, uh, we use the D node to you know, scale that up to however big it needs to be. Uh, for a, a file system or a clone, this thing is going to point down to an object set which actually has three D nodes in it. Uh, so the two of them are used for the user quota and the group quota, and the other one is used to describe the array of all of the I nodes, or D nodes actually, uh, that are describing the files and directories and so on here. Uh, you'll also see this little pointer off the side to this uh, zil is the ZFS intent log. Uh, one of the issues that we have with ZFS is that although the file system is always consistent, we've had some number of changes that have occurred since the last checkpoint was taken. And uh, if the system crashes, then when we reboot, we, the state that we get back is whatever the state was for the last checkpoint. So if you start making other changes, uh, unless you have some kind of uh, a log, you're going to lose those after a crash. And the reason that the, the, the intent log is, is particularly important is so that you can implement F-sync. Uh, when you see how much work it is to take a checkpoint, you'll understand that we can't implement F-sync by simply taking a checkpoint. A checkpoint is a big deal, it takes a long time, so you could do a few of those a second, but you couldn't do hundreds of them a second, uh, and you may, if you're running something like an SMTP server, be doing hundreds of F-syncs a second based on the rate of incoming mail. And so we need to use this uh, ZFS intent log to essentially log the, the F-sync so that after a crash, we will be able to start from the stable version of the file system and then run through the intent log to make sure that we get back at least everything uh, that uh, we agreed was going to be there. Okay, so this is not a, a, a traditional journal. A journal only tracks the metadata changes. Uh, this is a full log, so into the intent log here has to go not only the metadata changes that have happened, but also any data because F-Sync is committing uh, data, of, of course. All right, so uh, when you take a snapshot, all you really do is just take a reference to this object here. Uh, so over here you see the snapshot. Now you notice there's just a single D node shown in this picture, but there are in fact three here. 
uh, the, the, there's a frozen version of the group quota and a frozen version of the user quota. Uh, and that's convenient because then later if you take a clone, again, you just take a, a snapshot, you, know, you take a reference basically to this object, and then as it changes, of course, it'll create a new one uh, and leave the old unmodified one behind so the snapshot doesn't change. Uh, for Zvols, uh, the things that look like uh, a, a disk partition, uh, it's a, a much simpler thing. It just has underneath it two D nodes here, uh, one of which holds the master information, and the other is the array of blocks that make up the disk partition. So, uh, and then, of course, once you have one of these, you can run a database on what it thinks is just a raw disk, or you can format a traditional file system in there if you want. Uh, but you have the benefit that you can take a snapshot of your Zvol, just like you take a snapshot of a file system, uh, which is, uh, and make clones of it. And you, know, you can do, you have all the functionality that you normally get out of the, the MOS layer up here for your disk partition. Okay, so far so good, haven't lost anybody, not everybody. <laughs> okay, so checkpoints are sort of the, the key thing here, uh, and so I'm going to spend most of the rest of my time talking about how you actually take a ZFS checkpoint. So you start, when, when ZFS is running, you're, you're collecting all of the changes that are happening in memory. Uh, and if things are, you know, a lot of writing is happening, you're chewing through memory in a pretty good clip. Uh, so, at any rate, you're not writing anything to the file system, obviously. You're just collecting it all together in memory uh, as the modifications happen. So, you're, you're collecting the new data that's being written. Uh, when you grow a file, of course, you have to update the inode with the new size and potentially with new block pointers, et cetera. Uh, and all of those changes, the inode changes, the actual data that's being done, all of that is just being collected in memory, not being written to disk. Okay, so. Now you say, all right, I want to take a checkpoint. And there's the reasons for a checkpoint is a certain amount of time has passed or you've gotten a certain amount of dirty data uh, and that triggers uh, a checkpoint happening. Or a checkpoint will also happen if the administrator comes in and says, I want to take a snapshot. You start by taking a checkpoint and then you create the, the snapshot of that checkpoint. Okay, so you gather together all these things that have changed and you go find a chunk of, of available uh, disk space and you write it. And if there's a lot of contiguous space, all of the modifications that have been made get written in one big write. And this is the reason that writing in ZFS is so fast because unlike the traditional file system where you want to update, oh, well, you know, I've got to go over here and write the data for this file and over here write its inode and over there do something with a directory. And so instead of having these writes scattered all over the disk, it's just boom, all in one place. And once you do that, then uh, you have, you know, all that, that I.O. completes, you know it's all there, There's, you know, any RAID Z stuff has all been dealt with. Uh, then and only then, uh, the last step is that you write the Uber block. And the, the Uber block, there's not just one Uber block, there's actually typically several thousand of them, and so, but I, I did not have time to explain how we manage Uber blocks, but anyway, the or Uber block that represents this checkpoint gets written. Okay, so the entire pool is always consistent because when we write that Uber block, either we haven't written it and we have the old version or we have written it and we've got the new version. Okay, so as I've already said, the checkpoint affects all the file systems, all the clones, everything in the pool gets snapshotted at once. Okay, and as I also said, you need to log changes between the checkpoints in order to have persistence. All right, recovery starts from the last checkpoint. So you find, you come up, you find the, the Uber block for the most recent checkpoint, and you find the, in, the intent log, and I mean, you find the intent logs, there's one for every file system and every Zvol, and then you just roll forward through the log, and this, you know, as you go through the log, it's like write this, do that, do these other things. It just builds up a whole bunch of stuff in memory, just like you would from normal operation, and when you've got all that done, then you do a checkpoint and say, okay, boom, we're now all caught up, and uh, we can reset the logs because we're ready to, to, to move on. Okay, so what actually is involved? So in, in you, know, you know, I say we've got all this dirty data, but let's just look at what we actually have to do. 
So this is what you would have to do if one file had one block added to it, just to give you an idea. There's nine things that are going to have to be changed. What we start out down here in step one is there's the actual new data that got written. OK, that's not too surprising. But since we have added another block to the file, that means that, let's say we have a single level indirect block pointer here, we have to update that single level indirect block pointer with the new pointer, or, you know, with the pointer to the new data. And we can't change the existing single indirect block, so we have to make an, a copy of the single indirect block with the update made to it. And if it was a double indirect block, we'd then have to potentially, the, 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 the block above it would change because this has changed, therefore, the thing that points at it changed. So you have to trickle your way all the way up through all the indirect levels until you finally get to the inode. And now, of course, the inode is pointing to a new block. So the inode, or the, the new denode, has to be written. Uh, and then that, because this has changed, that is going to change the effect of this file, which means we have to trickle all the changes up through all the indirect blocks uh, here uh, up to the object set. Now the object set has a new pointer, so the object set has to be rewritten. The object set's been rewritten, so therefore the, files, the thing that points to it has to be rewritten, which means this thing has changed, so we have to change all the indirect blocks that go all the way back up to the top here. That has now changed, so we have to make a new copy of that. And then finally the last step is to point to that thing. So we, we figure out all the blocks that have changed all the way down from steps one through eight. We gather all of those now modified blocks we write them out, and once we, we get confirmation that they've all been written, then finally we update the Uber block. So the Uber block is the only thing that we ever overwrite in a, in a ZFS file system. Sorry? Uh, yes, oh yes, the point, he's pointed out that uh, I allocated a block out of the space map. So the space map has to change, uh, and if you, uh, back on this previous slide here, come on, talk to me. You'll see that the space map is, you know, it's a file, so you know, we changed one thing here, so we had to change all the indirect things up to here, so this changed, and that, that'll come in with this, the change that happened here as we trickle them up through there. So yeah, another, you know, three, four blocks have to be allocated and dealt with. Okay, so the, uh, you can see why we can't implement F-Sync simply by taking a checkpoint. Uh, the, the amount of work that we have to do, the amount of space that we need to allocate is such that uh, it would be just way too inefficient to do that. Now, it looks really bad because of all the things that trickle up here, but supposing we had two files that changed in this file system, uh, there'd be a, little, a few extra blocks for that file, but then all the rest of the stuff trickling up here We've already had to change it all already because of this first file. So it, it's, you don't get this much stuff for every modification that occurred. And that's why if you aggregate together a bunch of changes, uh, the overall, the, the cost of this trickle up is not nearly as bad. Uh, you know, we've already had to update the space map. We've already had to update all of these things. And so just updating one more file is not nearly as bad as the first file that we had to change. All right. So I just want to sort of finish up by summarizing sort of the strengths and weaknesses of ZFS. Um, ZFS is not going to replace FFS because uh, it requires a lot of resources and uh, it, you know, it, it's very well designed for sort of large, uh, large pools of, of systems or large pools of data and lots of file systems. But if all you have is a little embedded appliance and you need a file system to sort of manage a small amount of stuff, you're not going to do that with ZFS. I mean, that's just overkill and you don't have the resources to do it. So for the sort of embedded appliance where you have sort of a, usually a single disk drive, uh, FFS continues to be sort of the right solution. Where you've got large pools, uh, ZFS just blows FFS out of the water because it has all this redundancy and checking and other capabilities uh, that FFS could only dream about. Okay, so what are its strengths? The high write throughput, uh, as I already mentioned, instead of having to scatter stuff all over the place, it's just getting chunked down in one place. Uh, 
because it uses RAID Z, which I haven't had a chance to describe to you, uh, but with RAID Z, essentially each block, uh, since the RAID is integrated in with ZFS, uh, each block just gets its own uh, RAID stripe. And so uh, you don't have partial stripes that you're filling, you're always filling exactly uh, the block. And so the upshot of this is that when you reconstruct, you don't have to go, th when, when you want to rebuild a disk, you don't have to go through and reconstruct every block on the disk because you know which blocks are being used. Uh, the way you reconstruct RAID-Z is you just do a walk across the, the, all the file systems in the pool and figure out you know, which blocks they are using and then you re reconstruct those blocks. Uh, so if you have a pool that has a relatively low utilization, it's actually faster to reconstruct a RAID-Z pool than it is to reconstruct the whole physical media. Uh, unfortunately, if your pool is mostly full, it actually takes considerably longer to reconstruct the RAID-Z because there's a lot of random access stuff, whereas a traditional RAID re rebuild happens uh, sequentially across the disk. Uh, ZFS doesn't have the right hole problem with RAID. Uh, the right hole is where you've, you're updating a stripe and you've written some pieces of it but not other parts of it. Uh, and you have to have some NVRAM or some other way so that if the power fails when it comes back up, you know how to finish writing that. Uh, ZFS doesn't need to worry about that because it's not going to change the checkpoint until it knows all of the stripes are completely written. So it never has any block that's referenced by a, a file system that is incomplete. Uh, you can move blocks between file systems as needed. You know, how many times have you statically created FFS file systems and then wished that you'd put more in one file blocks in one file system and than you'd in another? It'd be really nice if I could just reach over into that other file system that's got all that free space and borrow some of it, uh, but obviously you can't do that. Uh, whereas with ZFS, they're just blocks in the pool. And so if a file system needs a lot of space, it gets it. And if it doesn't need it, it gives it back and some other file system can use it. It's monolithic, and I have a long list of things I don't like about monolithic, but one of the benefits of monolithic is that everything's integrated together. Uh, so the, 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 those master nodes, for example, keep track of where things are mounted and what things are exported and what the properties of those exports are. So you don't have to maintain all these other files like et cetera, FS tab and et cetera, remote, or uh, it was export, and uh, ZFS just tracks all that, it knows where things are, and it just makes all the mounts happen, uh, exports happen as they should. So it eases the administration. Okay, so where does it fall down? Well, the, uh, if you write a file slowly, then its blocks are going to end up scattered all over the disk. So think of a log uh, that's being written over several days' time. The, the blocks that make up that log are going to be all over the disk because they're written temporally. They're written as they're created. And so if you now want to grep that log, it's going to take a long time to run all over the disk to pick up all those pieces. Uh, the way ZFS deals with this is it simply makes sure that it has enough cache so that any files that you've read over the last day or so are just going to be in the cache, and then, in fact, that they're not well laid out on the disk doesn't matter. Uh, one of the reasons that ZFS wants you know, 8, 16 gigabytes of memory to be available is to mitigate these problems. Uh, I've already talked about reconstructing a nearly full pool uh, can go up to 10 times slower than if you just had physical media. Uh, the block cache has to fit in the kernel's address space. So in the traditional file system, we just map the blocks into the kernel when we need to look at them. So you can have a 32-bit processor with 16 gigabytes of memory, and you can use all of that memory as, as the buffer cache. In the case of ZFS, the way it's implemented, it wants all of physical memory to be mapped into the kernel. So if you're running on a 32-bit address space, your cache can't really be bigger than about a gigabyte, uh, no matter how much physical memory is on the machine. So the answer to this is, if you're going to run ZFS, just make sure you're on a 64-bit processor. Uh, FreeBSD will support it on 32-bit processors, but you will not be happy. So just don't do that. OK, uh, if the uh, pool gets more than about 75% full, 
the allocations start to get very, very painful. And it's because it wants these 128K blocks, and if there's not enough space to have those, then it has to start taking smaller pieces and putting them together in these things called gang blocks, and that's just painful. So uh, don't, don't really plan to run more than about 75% utilization. Uh, the good news is if you see you're getting too high, you can always just add more disks, because that just adds more space to the pool, and it can then just be handed out to all the other file systems. So unlike a traditional file system where you say, oh, I'm getting too full, it's like, well, no, just, you can just add disk to it, which is something that's not a property that you typically have with the regular file system. Okay, uh, by contrast, FFS will go to 95% quite happily and will go to about 99%, somewhat less happily. All right, um, RAID Z is, has a lot of good properties associated with it, but one of the less nice properties is if you're using 4K blocks, then you're, you have a 50% overhead if you're doing a single redundancy RAID. And so uh, the 4K blocks are typically used by ZVols or databases. And uh, so you are going to have a high overhead if you choose to, say, use 4K blocks. And uh, finally, the, the, the thing that's really a pain is that the blocks that are cached in memory are not part of the unified uh, buffer cache. It's got its own little world with the arc. And so if you're doing M mapping or Sun file, uh, you end up doing an extra memory to memory copy every time you read or write something. Okay, and I'm being yelled at to be done, so I'll push the button and get to questions. Any questions? Um, they do ask that you talk on the microphone so that people walking, uh, not in the room that are listening, can, can hear your, your very insightful questions. Surely somebody has a question. So uh, what about uh, symlink performance and implementation? What about symlinks? Symlinks. Why, what would be particularly difficult about them? I mean, th that's just a path yeah. name that points to a file, so. Yeah, but there were uh, places in the, in the headers. You're talking about like having to use a whole block to hold a symlink, is that the issue? The thing is that in UFS, if the symlink is small enough, it's stored inside the inode and not as a file. Yes, okay. So uh, remember I said that the D node had this extra space at the end of it? Um, so that extra space can be used to hold a symlink. So they pretty much do the same game as we do in FFS for that. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, I can tell you all one. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think almost everybody in this room knows uh, for the difficulty in uh, installing uh, and adding devices to ZFS uh, pools uh, with uh, four kbytes physical sectors. I mean uh, those advanced format disks. Uh, it, it is used, um, uh, no, no devices is, uh, are made, and uh, then they are added to the pool. Uh, otherwise, ZFS uh, reads the device's properties and starts to use uh, 50, uh, 1500, uh, 1500 kbytes uh, sectors. So in the next version, versions, are there any improvements in this? Um. Well, I can only speculate on what the ZFS developers are going to do since I don't actually develop ZFS. Um, but uh, given the issue that you have raised, I would be very surprised if that's not something that they plan to do. It's already fixed in 10.1. Oh, I'm told. <laughs> you have to speak. Hi. Uh, there's a sysctl called minimum A shift that you can set so that you can force any device added to your pool to be treated with a uh, block size of 4K. Okay, and that, you That's said, when, already, when did that show up? Uh, it's already in 9.3 and will be in 10.1. Okay. Uh, so, Kirk, can, 
Can we expect you to join the ZFS development team anytime, anytime soon? Can you expect me to join the ZFS development team? Um, probably not. Uh, when I was younger, I used to take on projects. You, you probably know about this because uh, you do ZFS and you think you're done. And then they keep coming back to you and say, well, how about this and how about that? And can't you do this and can't you do that? So uh, it, this has happened to me. I, I, I had Early on, I took on the fast file system, the VM system, and NFS. And I've managed to shed the VM system and NFS, thankfully, but uh, I'm still on the hook pretty much for FFS. But, so I'm, I'm not into finding another project that I could be on the hook for. <laughs> this is spoken by the person that did the original port of ZFS to FreeBSD, let me say. <laughs> All right, well, it's definitely time for us to have some lunch. So thank you very much. Thank you.